Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual program organized by Fairfax County Public Library. Our guest tonight is poet Sandra Beasley. She's an accomplished writer. She published four books of poetry. Uh, her latest collection, Made to Explode, came out just a few months ago. Sandra also wrote a memoir of growing up with severe food allergies, uh, which can also double up as a cultural history of food allergy. Sandra is recipient of numerous uh, literary uh, awards and fellowships. She also a local author. She used our library a lot uh, when she was growing up in Vienna, Virginia. Uh, now Sandra lives in Washington, D.C., and she's joining us today. Uh, welcome to our program, Sandra. Well, hello, everyone. I'll take it over from there. Um, I just want to say that I'm so thrilled for folks who can tune in in real time tonight. I know there's probably more who might view this later. Um, I'm so intrigued by the weather here in the DC, Virginia area, this type of gray, little bit of hard rain. Uh, it's funny because it reminds me of weather that I actually felt and experienced at Tyson's Pimmett Library, uh, dropped off for a whole afternoon on an otherwise overcast and useless Saturday or Sunday, just hanging out for two, even three hours at a time. I was uh, checking my wallet, and sure enough, it's very old now because uh, I have not tried to update it because my, my legal address is now in BC, but sure enough, I still have my Fairfax County Public Library card. Oh tucked away in my wallet. So I just, uh, I just want to really say how honored I am to hold this space and to just share with you all a little bit about how I became a poet, how I became a writer, what inspired me. Um, we'll have, just to give you a, a sense of how things will be paced, I'm going to read three of my poems and then I'm going to read a handful of poems that inspired me to become a writer. And then I'm going to read three more of my poems that are all linked, that are all combined. Uh, and, and then we'll just open it up for questions. So this will take less than an hour. Um, if you have to get up and do dinner in the meantime, I understand. But again, I'm just so thrilled to have this time with you all. I also just want to mention as an accessibility measure that if you're in this Zoom in real time, you have the option of getting captions. That's a button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can select live transcript. So if you have any hearing difficulties or other uh, access issues, that's something that could help. Um, I am a disabled writer, and I think it's really important whenever possible to bring accommodation into these shared literary experiences. All right. Uh, so again, I'm Sandra. I grew up in, uh, gosh, this is local. So I'm going to say I grew up in Wolf Den, right off Route 7. Our house backed up against the uh, National Park. We could hear concerts from Wolf Trap at night. Um, I've got friends who are tuned in, who all have their various experiences of growing up in Northern Virginia. Um, I'm going to read what do I do to break the ice? I'm going to read a doorstep poem. So what do I mean by a doorstep poem? I mean that one of my favorite things about poetry is that it can take us into different worlds, unexpected spaces. So I love a poem that opens with some premise that uh, creates surprise, creates, uh, I don't know what, surreal surreality, um, a sense of just difference. And so this poem opens with a doorbell being rung and an answer on the other side that seems like it's from a different world. The title is Another Failed Poem About the Greeks. And why did I call it that? I called that, uh, I called the poem this because it plays with Greek mythology with like riffing, if, you, if you're familiar with the famous stories of the gods and the warriors, you might hear ideas or names of characters that resonate. Uh, I also called it this because sometimes people ask me how to deal with writer's block. And my answer is that it helps if in your drafting process, you set the bar really low. So when I went through a period of writer's block, I called a bunch of poems, failed poems. Another failed poems about birds, another failed poem about music. And sometimes when you try to write a failed poem, you just fail at writing a poem. 
but sometimes you write something that you would have never given yourself permission to write otherwise. And that's the idea with this. So this is uh, from I Was the Jukebox, my second collection. It's called Another Failed Poem About the Greeks. His sword dripped blood. His helmet gleamed. He dragged a gorgon's head behind him. As first dates go, this was problematic. He itched and fidgeted. He said, could I save something for you? But I was all out of maidens bound to rocks. So I took him on a roller coaster, wedging in next to his breastplated body in the little car. He put his arm around me as the Greeks do. On the first dip, he laughed. On the first drop, he clutched my shoulder and screamed like a catamite. When we ratcheted to a full stop, he said, again. We went on the scrambler, the apple turnover, the log flume. We went on the pirate ship three times, swooshing forward, back, upside down, and he cried, Ara, waving his sword, until the operator asked him to please keep all swords inside the car. He was a good sport, letting the drachmas fall out of his pockets, sparing the girl who spilled punch on his shield, waving as I rode the carousel's hippogriff. Though it was a slow ride, and I made him hold my purse. On the way home, he said, we should do this again sometime. Though we both knew it would never happen, since he was Greek, of course, and dead. And somewhere, a maiden rattled in her chains. So that uh, is a poem. It's just a poem about surprise, about opening up you know, thinking you might see whatever, delivery man, uh, next door neighbor, and instead finding a Greek warrior. And what do you do with that reality? That to me is part of the fun. Uh, poems transform reality. I want to read another poem from I Was the Jukebox called The Piano Speaks. Uh, now, one of the things that I'm most interested in what poetry can do is speak in unconventional voices, unexpected points of view. So one thing I often mention with the Piano Speaks is if you've ever played a musical instrument and given it up, uh, if you've ever, you know, rented a viola for the year and then found out you hated the orchestra teacher and it ended up kind of being left in the closet, um, if you ever thought you were going to learn to play guitar and then learned that soccer uh, club was like a lot more fun instead, um, just imagine that musical instrument lapsing into silence, lapsing into being unplayed. So the premise of this poem is a piano that's been kind of abandoned. And then the epigraph says, after Eric Satie. You don't have to know who Eric Satie is, but if you do know, you know he's a composer. He plays these beautiful, delicate compositions. And so the idea is kind of the piano, long abandoned, is visited by Eric Satie, this brilliant musician. What would it have to say after being played once again, being kind of woken from its long sleep? The piano speaks after Eric Satie. For an hour, I forgot my fat self, my neurotic innards, my addiction to alignment. For an hour, I forgot my fear of rain. For an hour, I was a salamander, shimmying through the kelp in search of shore, and under his fingers, the notes slid loose from my belly in a long jelly rope of eggs that took root in the mud. And what would hatch, I did not know. A lie, a waltz, an apostle of glass. For an hour, I stood on two legs and ran. For an hour, I panted and galloped. For an hour, I was a maple tree. And under the summer of 
his fingers, the notes, seated and winged away in the clutch of small, elegant helicopters. Oh, that roll of thunder, uh, thanks to downtown DC weather, makes it very dramatic. So just to backtrack, um, I am of Northern Virginia, and these two poems that I've read, Another Failed Poem About the Greeks and The Piano Speaks, are both informed in really subtle ways by Virginia things. And that is the fact that um, all of the amusement park rides in Another Failed Poem About the Greeks, they're all reminiscent of King's Dominion or Bush Gardens, mostly King's Dominion though. Um, and that memory of capturing eggs uh, from a from a pond that would then be hatched in the piano speaks that is straight out of doing an annual harvest of eggs of tadpoles um, and little lizards uh, from the shores of the pond and wolf trap woods where my family still has a house today so I it's funny because I don't always think of myself as a regional poet although my most recent book made to explode, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, that is very much informed by Northern Virginia, DC. But when I look at backwards at my work, I see all kinds of place markers. And that's one thing I would say for anyone is that, you know, you're, where you're from, uh, whether it be literal geography or kind of emotional geography, it will always inform what you write and how you write it. Uh, one of the toughest things to learn is to talk about diction, which is word choice, because we take our own dictions for granted. We all speak in a very particular way based on who we grew up around. I had a grandmother who, when you were talking about closing a door, would say, did you pull the door too? And it took me years to notice that not everyone said it that way. Uh, and so I would just say that begin right now, if you're thinking about writing your own work, um, think about that not as a drawback, but as an asset, as an incredible gift of language and ideas and word choices that you have particular to who you are in the world and the way you would choose to express yourself. So uh, the last poem I read was called The Piano Speaks. It's about music. I want to read a different poem about music, and then I'm going to switch to reading some poems by other folks to talk about poems that inspired me. Um, but The Piano Speaks is very much about inhabiting another voice, another persona. Uh, this poem uses a different musical instrument, and it's more in my own voice, I would say. Um, it's talking about love. It's in particular talking about love across long distances. It's, a, it's from a collection called Count the Waves, and you can think about the waves of the title in a lot of different ways. Um, iteration, like there's some formal play in these poems with waves of repetition of a phrase or an idea, but also just uh, from sea to shining sea, what happens when you're trying to create a life and you're traveling all the time, and how do you measure distance in a way that feels meaningful um, and can still uh, create connections with people even when you're not close to them. So I'm going to read a very short poem called Ukulele, and you are free to picture an actual ukulele. I wish I had one in my office to show you all at this moment, but um, it's just playing with the idea of this somewhat modest, quirky instrument as a way of creating epic tales of love. And like a lot of my poems, it shows my interest in kind of research, in looking up the alternative story of something or the meaning of a word or a phrase. Uh, I mention that because that is so tied into my love of libraries. Uh, one thing that libraries do is they give us uh, resources, uh, encyclopedias. I know now in the age of the internet, we think less of encyclopedias as physical things. But back in the day, the library was the only place where I could access just countless resources that we would never buy or own or have make a shelf space for um, at our house. Ukulele. The vessel is simple, a rowboat among yachts. No one hides a Tommy gun in its case. No blues man runs over his uke in a whiskey rage. The last 
of the Hawaiian Queens translated the name gift that came here, while Portuguese historians translate jumping flea, the way a player's fingers pick and fly. If you have a cigar box, it'll do. If you have fishing line, it'll sing. If there is to be one instrument of love, not love vanished or imagined, but love, it's this one. Fit a melody in the crook of your arm and strum. So thinking about the uh, the ukulele is that kind of modest, strange, ungainly instrument of love. That was kind of my my idea there. So I want to pause and swivel a little bit. I want to share a few poems with you all that inspired me to become a writer, poems that I loved from childhood on. And what's so fun for me is that in almost all the cases, I have the original physical book that I pulled that poem from. So admittedly not library books, but, but very much in the spirit of books you might find at a library. Um, I wanted to start by sharing the very first poem I ever memorized. It is an Emily Dickinson poem. Uh, this book comes from my grandparents' basement, which was in McLean, Virginia. Uh, and it was basically, you know, the funny thing for me is I don't know how I could have found this poem without actually reading this whole book, which feels unimaginable, but I have no idea how I found this poem otherwise. It was one that for me resonated with, I don't know, a certain sadness. I don't think people always talk about how childhood can have a lot of space for sadness in it and for solitude. And it was a poem that I found memorizing gave me comfort. So I'm going to turn to the page, but to be honest, I actually think I could probably recite it with my eyes closed if I had to. Emily Dickinson. Uh, in this book, this is marked as poem 563. My life closed twice before it's closed. It yet remains see if immortality unveil a third event to me. So huge, so hopeless to conceive as these that twice befell. Parting is all we know of heaven and all we need of hell. So not a long poem, but it manages to create this huge echo through its use of sound. Uh, this idea of my life closed, closed twice before it's closed, this idea that we all have these kind of epic losses that help define who we are, and that that doesn't necessarily, it can be sad, but it's also foundational, uh, that we all have these losses that we must experience as we go forward, that it helps us understand where we might fit into a larger universe. Uh, I just remember doing pace after pace around my grandparents' sunken living room, reciting these verses to myself until they were fixed in my head. Another poem that I loved, which uses, so that one kind of rhymes, right? You can hear the echoes, the sound. Um, the next poem I'm going to read has sound play, but it doesn't have exactly the same sense of rhyme. It's by a poet named E.E. E. Cummings. So both Emily Dickinson and E.E. E. Cummings, they played a lot with typography. Uh, they played a lot with where to capitalize, where to do a dash, where to do a period. You can almost think of it as like less about proper English and more about musical scoring, kind of scoring the breath, scoring the phrase. So I think for me, one big uh, influential thing was that I thought of poets as composers of language, not writers. They were bringing all the sound play uh, that they could to the, to the front of a tongue, to the front of a reader's mind. So this is a poem by E. e. Cummings that is, I guess in some ways, also about loss, but it's, it's playful. It has a kind of, um, well, I'll just let y'all hear it. Weirdly enough, in this book, uh, this is a, one of the collected of Cummings' work. Um, it's under a category called Adult Nursery Rhymes. Oh, by the by, has anybody seen little you, I, 
who stood on a green hill and threw his wish at blue. With a swoop and a dart, out flew his wish. It dived like a fish, but it climbed like a dream. Throbbing like a heart, singing like a flame, blue took it my far beyond far and high beyond high. Bluer took it your, but bluest took it our, away beyond where. What a wonderful thing is the end of a string, murmurs little you, I, as the hill becomes nil, and will somebody tell me why people let go? So it's funny because when I read the Emily Dickinson poem about a life closing twice before it's closed, it lit something up in me because I recognize a story in it that I could identify with. When I read the E. Cummings poem, it lights something up in me because there's no one story I can identify, but it still feels true. It still feels evocative in some way that's really, you know, can somebody tell me why people let go? I don't know what this poem means. I teach poetry, uh, and one of the things I often say to my students is, can we please set aside the question of what does the poem mean? I can't tell you. If the author was standing right here, they couldn't tell you either. Or if they did, I wouldn't trust what they told you. Uh, I think we have to stop worrying about what a poem is about or what it means and think about what a poem is concerned with, what it is concerned with on a level of rhyme or form or lineation or movement, what it is concerned with on a level of story. Um, but you're not always gonna read a poem and know what it quote unquote means. And I think that the sooner you get comfortable with that, the easier it is to become a lover of poetry. So one thing that you hear in both of the poems I read is lots of musicality. Uh, I'm going to read another really important poet who um, drives home a point through music, but whereas with E. Cummings it feels like an exhalation that's kind of playful and wistful, here it's one where you really feel dramatic uh, impact and some tension. This is uh, from Langston Hughes' The Panther and the Lash. There's a lot of Langston, Langston Hughes collections out there. Uh, back in the day, what amazed me was that this was one I could find in an airport. Just being in an airport bookshop and finding any uh, poet on the shelf that wasn't in an anthology was super exciting. Um, but I also think it's a really wonderful collection because it, it focuses on Langston Hughes poems that are related to civil rights, uh, the civil rights movement, uh, and awareness of what it means to be Black in America. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I can co-opt that understanding, but I'm going to, to read a, a poem that was really important to me and one where I hope you'll hear how musicality can not just like soften and open up a possibility, but sometimes it can be an edge that cuts. Sometimes it can be something that really drives a point home. This is a poem uh, you'll hear if you know anything about uh, American theater, you'll hear a line in this poem that yielded a really important play by Lorraine Hansberry, A Raisin in the Sun. But, uh, but the poem itself is called Dream Deferred by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? You know, I think that for a lot of us, um, when we have an early exposure to poetry, and then we feel like, oh, well, maybe I'm serious about this, we get scared off by the things that contemporary poetry tells us a poem is supposed to do. And in the wrong hands, not all hands, but in the wrong hands, that means that a poem is not allowed to rhyme that it's supposed to be long, 
that its meaning is supposed to feel slightly inaccessible or coded. Um, and you know, there are great poems that do all those things, but there's such important poems that don't. It's fine if you love a poem because it sings to you. It's fine if you love a poem because it seems to speak somewhat plainly, uh, but forcefully to, to a truth that you need to hear voiced. Um, I think that one of my favorite things about moving through the world as a poet is that I can never get too far away from emotion, central emotion, uh, the, the kind of um, eros and thanatos that, you know, that keeps us going through the world. So I want to read one more poem uh, by a poet who inspired me, and then I'll move back to my own work for a little bit, and then we'll open it up for a few questions. Uh, this is a poem by Sandra Cisneros. Uh, so I guess of the three poets I'm reading, Sandra Cisneros is still with us, a uh, terrific force. Um, and this is from her book, Loose Woman. I don't know if anybody from Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Tech is in the audience, but uh, uh, Ms. Curtis, you're the one who, who got me turned on to Loose Woman. And this is a poem that uh, doesn't use music or rhyme in quite the same way as the others I've read, but it's called Night Madness Poem. And it's one of the ones where I first thought about the ways that a voice uh, could feel liberated through poetry, particularly that a woman's voice could feel liberated through poetry. It's a fierce poem. Night Madness Poem. There's a poem in my head like too many cups of coffee. A pea under twenty eiderdowns, a sadness in my heart like stone, a telephone, and always my night madness that outs like bats across this Texas, Texas sky. I'm the crazy lady they warned you about, the she of rumor talked about, and worse, who talks. It's no secret. I'm here, under a circle of light, the light always on, resisting a glass, an easy cigar, the kind who reels the twilight sky, swoop, circling. I'm witch woman, high on tobacco and holy water. I'm a woman, delighted with her disasters. They give me something to do, a profession of sorts keeps me industrious and of some serviceable use. In dreams, the origami of the brain opens like a fist, a pomegranate, an expansive geometry. Not true. I haven't a clue why I'm rumpled tonight. Choose your weapon. Mine, the telephone, my tongue, both black as a gun. I have the power of words, the power to charm and kill at will, to kill myself, or to aim haphazardly and kill you. So from Sandra Cisneros from Loose Woman, a fellow Sandra, right? That was that was also a big deal to me to see another Sandra's name on the the front of a book cover. Those are some of the poems that got me, I mean, honestly, like these four poems that I've shared with you, they, they take me from age eight through age 18. They take me through from those years where I, I felt the power of poetry to just channel something essential, some energy that needed to get out in the world. Uh, I was fortunate to often be in schools that really um, made space for poetry, uh, starting all the way back in elementary school. Rose McMurray, uh, Fairfax County Public Schools, my middle school teachers, uh, Ms. Sloan, um, my teachers at Thomas Jefferson High School, people would not think a science and tech school would have space for creative writing. And all the while, Fairfax County Public Libraries, all the while Tyson's Pimmer region, Regional. I mean, I just can't tell you how many, I, I sometimes tested the, I believe, limit of 50 books checked out at a time. So what I wanna do is I just wanna take a little bit longer. Um, I'm gonna share three poems of mine that are linked and then we'll open it up for questions. But I thought since this is a meet the poet opportunity, I wanted to talk a little bit about process. Um, so I'm gonna do, uh, I need a prop, right? All right, here's my prop, tomato. 
I'm going to read you three poems, uh, and I'm leaning over because I've got stuff, I've got books stacked all around. As you can tell, I, I live in a room full of books. Um, I want to start with the very first poem in my very first book, which was inspired by writing prompt. If you're in school at any level, you've probably had writing prompts. I know we often rebel against them, but sometimes they do magic. So I was in a class where we were given the prompt of writing about objects of the natural world. So the table was covered with shells and branches and dried flowers and all this beautiful stuff. And I totally got last pick. I was in the hall getting a drink of water when everyone else chose their objects. So I come back in and there is this plastic pint container of tomatoes. And I was like, I don't wanna write about tomatoes. But that was the assignment. And so I thought, well, why do I have such a strong reaction to tomatoes? Why is that such a difficult thing for me to write about? And it made me realize that my family had a funny relationship to tomatoes. My father hates them. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it's important to say the, the speaker of a poem is not the same as the poet, but it, we absolutely draw from the well of our lives and what inspires us. So uh, thanks in advance to my dad about being, you know, sturdy about being cited in this poem. I went home. We were supposed to write an ode to our assigned object. I could not write an ode. An ode is supposed to be a, a poem of admiration and love. No, anti-ode. Uh, a, a poem that is saying, why do I struggle with this thing? What does this tell me about myself and, in my case, my family? Cherry tomatoes. Little bastards of vine. Little demons by the pint. Red eggs that never hatch, just collapse and rot. When my mom told me to gather their grubby bodies into my skirt, I'd cry. You and your father, she chide, the way each time I kicked and wailed against sailing. My dad shook his head, said, you and your mother. Now, a city girl. I ease one loose from its siblings, from its clear plastic coffin, place it on my tongue just to try. The smooth surface resists, resists, and erupts in my mouth, seeds, juice, acid, blood of a perfect household. The way when I finally went sailing, my stomach was rocked from inside out, little boat, big sea, handful of skinned sunset. So this is the very first poem in my very first book, which uh, was published, oh, 2008, right? But you know, the funny thing about poets is we get an image set in our head and it stays with us. Um, and that's true of a lot of poets. You know, Stanley Kunitz has his, his stones and his turtles and his moons. You know, I think we often have poems uh, that, that recirculate and revisit these ideas. So some years later, I was editing an anthology called Vinegar and Char, and an anthology is a collection of other people's poems all grouped together according to a theme or an era or a, a ge geography. Um, so here it was Southern poems, Southern poems about food. So when I was reading everyone else's Southern poems about food, I thought about mine, uh, and I was asked to write mine. And so there's a poem that was published in 2014 so going from a poem written before 20, 2007 to a poem for uh, 2014, seven years later, and I still was thinking about those darn tomatoes. Uh, and I still was thinking, you know, but I got kind of gone from thinking about my immediate family unit to uh, the question of, all right, well, it's one thing to discuss why a dad or anybody would arbitrarily not like tomatoes, but what's the family story? What's the origin of that? So I wrote a poem for the Southern Foodways Alliance that appeared in a journal called Gravy, and it was called Heirloom. And it takes that idea of tomatoes, but it kind of tracks it backwards and thinks about the generation before the father's generation. 
I'll read you that poem and then I'll read you one more poem and then we'll, we'll break for questions. So heirloom. My father will never enjoy the heavy sunrise sweetness of a golden tomato dashed with oil layered in basil. As with spinach, as with olives, he tastes only the claustrophobia of salt his Texan mother unleashed from a can a half century ago, feeding four children on a budget. We talk little of this. The foods our parents cooked to mush, pepper to ash, flavors forever rendered to chore, that this too was a form of love. What I remember is how during a snowstorm that stranded our school bus, I hiked to my grandmother's instead, and she made me not chicken soup from scratch or braise of bacon and cabbage, but rather a tray of tater tots straight from freezer to oven. They goldened like July. We ate them with our fingers while we played Scrabble, waiting until it was safe to take me home. So I go in that version of the poem from thinking about the dislike of tomatoes in a kind of unflattering way of thinking about the grandmother, you know, like, oh, she wasn't a great cook, she was constantly cooking from cans, uh, to, to a, a beautiful memory of the grandmother, which is her once again using a fast product, a, a, you know, a, a tater tot, a frozen potato product, in a way that is comforting and beautiful, and kind of recognizing the duality that um, there's no such thing as a bad cook, there's no such thing as a good cook. There's cooks that are trying to nourish and to treat, and then there are cooks that are maybe are, are cooking with less than kindness. That's really what you're tasting. You're tasting love, you're, or you're tasting kindness. Um, and so I, I really wanted to kind of unpack that fixation on tomatoes. So this was a poem that was published in 2014 in a journal. And here's where we move to my most recent book, because in uh, this year, 2021, February, I published a book called Made to Explode. And part of what this book holds is this critical mass of poems about food. Uh, but because the poems are also about Americanness and kind of our, our the good and the bad of our, our national identity, I wanted to, okay, I went from tomatoes in the father's generation, to tomatoes in the grandmother's generation, to tater tots via the grandmother. Now we're going history of tater tots. And if I were a real pro, the same way I've been able to hold up a tomato, I would totally hold up a cooked tater tot right now. If you, in fact, need to leave this reading and go eat tater tots right now, I completely understand. But I'm going to hope you're going to stay with me for one more poem and maybe some questions. Because what I love to say is that all of my tater tot origin story here is, is factual, it's true. Uh, but it once again takes, uh, you'll actually hear some lines that are that echo, they echo the poem I just read that is called Heirloom. But what I'm going to read is a poem that was published uh, seven years later, also called Heirloom, but a kind of bigger, heftier version of that story. And that to me is one of the things that poems can do. They can grow a story that starts off as a very small personal reference point. They can grow that in unexpected ways. So again, I'm going to read Heirloom from Made to Explode, my most recent book, which I am thrilled to say is in Fairfax County Public Library's collection now. And, uh, and then if you have any questions, you can put them into the chat, or um, we'll see if anybody wants to, to voice something out loud, but I'd love to be in dialogue with you all just a little bit before we wrap for the evening. One thing that I will mention, uh, just because this is the biggest, it's the longest poem I'm reading tonight, so it might feel a little bit dense, is that you'll hear the language of low over and over. You'll hear, hear this kind of repetition. So there's a word in poetry called anaphora. Anaphora is when you organize a series of sentences by starting them off with the same word or the same phrase. 
And I chose low because I wanted it to have a little bit of a sound of, of something from religion. Uh, the family that is responsible for tater tots being in the world is a religious family. They're a family of faith. And so I thought it was appropriate to give their origin story. I would use that, that structure. Heirloom. Low. Twelve children born to a woman named Thankful in Nampa by the border between Oregon and Idaho or as it will be remembered, or Ida. Lo, two of her sons drive to Miami not knowing if their plan will work. Lo, what were once waste scraps fed to the cows now repackaged. The fry shavings sliced, spiced, and oiled. Lo, a chef at the Fontainebleau takes the bribe. Lo, tater tots, are dished onto the tables of the 1954 National Potato Convention and soon enshrined in the freezers of America. Three decades later, the golden age of my childhood is a foil lined tray plattered with Orida product, maybe salt, maybe nothing but hot anticipation of my fingertips. Lo, my mother is a great cook, and lo, my grandmother is a terrible one. But on tin foil planes, they are equal. I need you to understand why my father will never enjoy an heirloom tomato glistening layered in basil. Put away your brandy wines, your Cherokee purples, your green zebras. Low as with spinach, as with olives, he tastes only the claustrophobia his mother unleashed from cans to feed four children on a budget. We talk little of this. Low what is cooked to mush. Low what is peppered to ash. Low the flavor rendered as morning chore that this too is a form of love. So again, that's a, that's a poem from my most recent collection, Made to Explode, and I hope it's interesting to hear that idea, this, uh, the, the chore rendered as a form of love, to hear that first originating in a poem that I published in 2014, and then before that, in a way to hear that originating in a poem that I wrote in 2007 or prior to that. So to just understand that even though poets work in very short, small spaces a lot of the times, the ideas that we're working with uh, have lots of time, lots of breathing room. Uh, so that, you know, you, you should think of those, those uh, short word counts uh, more as a process of distillation and not as a process of quick work. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I, I really appreciate y'all's attention. I know we've got some folks joining us in real time and some folks who will watch this later, but I think now is a good time for me to pause and see if anybody has a question that they wanna share in the chat or by raising a hand. I can also turn back to our host for the evening. So one question that I see in the chat already is what are some of the more difficult aspects of becoming a poet or, and writer? Uh, Asya, thank you for that good question. Um, so I think that, uh, <laughs> well, everything's hard. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that, I think that um, becoming a poet is a beautiful choice because it keeps your creative self and your emotional self close to the surface. And it's a hard choice because it keeps those things close to the surface. And you have to deal with so much rejection. Uh, you know, the, the first book I read from Theories of Falling, I would say every single poem in this, my, my debut collection, my first collection, every single poem got rejected multiple places, like 10 places, uh, you know, where I sent individual poems to be published by journals. So it's hard because you have to have a lot of faith that you, well, on one hand, you have to be open to constructive criticism. You have to be open to asking yourself, is this poem ready? Does it need more work? Is there something that I'm overlooking that I'm assuming the reader gets, but they don't? 
Uh, but then at a certain point, you just have to say, no, this poem's doing what it needs to do. And I'm just going to kind of keep my head down and keep going. I'm a Taurus, so we're, we're bulls, we're stubborn, we're really good at just persevering. And, uh, and I, I, I'm going to know that it will find the home that it needs to find. And that's hard. I mean, artists are, you know, we have to have a certain amount of ego to step on stage. I know right, right now we're in a virtual space, but how many times have I read sometimes in very crowded spaces where half the people in the room didn't even want to listen to a poem. Uh, and you just have to get up and be willing to share yourself uh, despite that. So it it's, can be tough. But on the other hand, when someone connects with your work, uh, just earlier today on social media, someone who I don't know very well mentioned that uh, my book was the favorite one, the same book, same book, that she loved to loan to other people, to, to students of her own, to the point where she, it was battered and bruised and the binding was coming apart. And that means so much to me. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful life, but it doesn't make you a lot of money and you have to be willing to take a lot of rejection and not let it uh, dim your spirit. Just keep going. But that's a great question. Uh, and I'm sure it's one that every single person in this room who's thought about being a writer has asked themselves. Yeah. Anything else? Let me ask my question. That'd so, be great. Yeah, thank you. The library. Uh, so at what age did you realize that you're good at poetry? Is that, that writing and teaching poetry could be your vocation? Well, it's so interesting that you say it that way because, um, you know, the question of when did I decide that I could be good at poetry is a little different um, from deciding that I wanted to be a poet. Uh, because what, what I'm trying to say is that on one hand, I was so lucky that I had opportunities to workshop poems from a young age. Uh, and that so in a sense, and my, my mother's a painter, my mother's a visual artist, so I was always around artists. But at the same time, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I went to Thomas Jefferson, which is a high school for science and technology. So I, I got a kind of mixed message that my creativity was a wonderful thing about me, but also impractical, that I needed to be thinking about what my real job would be. Um, and it really took a certain rebellion uh, to say like, uh, but I'm going to actually be a poet. I'm going to try to make a living <laughs> this way, um, you know, versus being like a lawyer who loved to write poems on the side. Uh, and so I, I, I think that, and even by the time I got to college where I could specialize in studying poetry, here's what I, here's one thing that I really want people to understand. I did not feel like one of the best poets. I did not feel like one of the poets for whom talent was so manifest that I had to do it. I was not one of the coolest poets. I was um, a poet who wrote a lot and was really persistent. And that's what I'm trying to say, is that I think that a lot of times people think that artistry, who becomes an artist, is going to be determined by who is judged as having the most talent that's not how it shakes out. A lot of times, you know, 10 years down the road, despite whatever early acclaim goes to whoever, the, the people who are actually functioning artists are the people who are the most stubborn about it. There's a real, there's a real art to being stubborn. Uh, and so, so that's, um, that's what I would say is that, you know, when, when did I decide that poetry was what I was best at? I'm still not sure it's what I'm best at or that I'm the best poet in a given group of people. Uh, I just know that I'm, I'm determined to do it. it it's, it's kind of critical for me as a, as a way of navigating the world. So I, I hope that's a question that respects, or I hope that's an answer, respects the question, but is also kind of honest about the mixed feelings. Um, so another question, what did I study in college? What are some other things that have inspired you in your writing? Okay, so this is really important. I, I studied a lot of creative writing in college. However, however, I wish I had made even more time to study things that were not about creative writing because what I have found is that so much of what I learned about the larger world 
becomes the core material that excites and wakes up my poems. So in other words, when I write a poem called Another Failed Poem About the Greeks, I'm not actually drawing on my English classes or my poetry workshops. I'm drawing on the classical mythology class I took on UVA grounds, which at the time was hosted in this strange building that the classics classes were up, up above and the, there was a firing range down below. So right in the middle of hearing lectures on the Greek gods, we'd hear like pistol shots. It's very odd. Uh, but um, so, you know, like, or the natural science classes that I took. One thing if you read my books is there's tons of references to animals, biology, zoology, chemistry. So, you know, yes, I studied a lot of poetry and a lot of uh, English language and literature, and I, I'm grateful for that. But it is so important to keep history and astrology, astrology, well, astrology, but astronomy, uh, mathematics, you, you just don't know what is going to ultimately be the thing that makes a poem of yours exciting in yours. So I, I think that just a, a sheer curiosity around the world is so important, especially at the, the high school and the college level. Um, so just keep taking those classes that, that challenge you. Uh, and so in the same way, you know, how do you, where do I find inspiration? How do I capture that inspiration? Almost all of my poems begin in curiosity. Uh, even in the, the sequence from Cherry Tomatoes to, um, to Heirloom, to the second version of Heirloom, you know, the curiosity of like, why do I have this gut resistance to Cherry Tomatoes? To then, okay, why does my dad hate Cherry Tomatoes? To then, okay, now I'm thinking about tater tots. What's the history of a tater tot? I mean, I think most questions that are, well, most poems that really work start with a question. And part of the reason why it is that way is that uh, the best poems surprise you as the writer. And that's what makes them able to surprise you all as the reader. Uh, you know, and without that surprise that the poem's not ever going to really thrive. So I, I just would say that that, um, that fundamental curiosity about the world is so important. And even now, when I, when I travel, uh, you know, my two favorite things to do are go to bookstores and go to museums. And I go to museums because it always tells me something that I don't know about the world. And I go to bookstores because I love looking at the shelves and seeing friends' names on the spines, on the books. So it's like both a simultaneous dislocation of looking for things that challenge me and a, and a relocation of finding people and names and ideas that make me feel at home in my literary community, which travels with me wherever I go. Uh, so it's, it's um, yeah. And writing about, about place too, just always being open to images, uh, sounds, unfamiliar tastes, unfamiliar scents. Anything that's sensory information that's new to you could be new to your reader as well. Any other questions? Let me just, uh, you know, I, I specifically, as I said, uh, wanted to speak more generally about um, meeting the poet, so to speak, kind of the, the arc of my work. But let me just say about Made to Explode, uh, of all of my books of poetry, this is the one that reflects most directly on growing up in Northern Virginia and now having lived in D.C. for essentially the second half of my life. Uh, there are poems that talk about the military culture of being uh, inside or just outside the Beltway. There are poems about monuments and memorials. There's a poem that plays with all of the names that we almost gave the wizards uh, back when they were the bullets, before they came the wizards. You know, like there's just lots of poems in here that I think are going to resonate uh, in, you know, in, in both fond ways and sometimes uncomfortable ways for anyone who grew up in this area when I did. And so I'm super proud of that. And it's really a, a joy for me to share a book like this with this community through Fairfax County Public Libraries. And I just want to say again how grateful I am, uh, both for this space. This is a weird uh, time. I'm, I'm doing this with you all tonight. I'm giving the graduation remarks for Thomas Jefferson High School on Saturday. Uh, their graduating class of 
2001 or 2001, 2021, bless them. Uh, and then I'm also doing a seminar on memoir uh, for, for another aspect of Fairfax County Public Libraries in July. So this, this chance to give back to the community has, has just meant so much to me. And be very grateful. Uh, on behalf of the library, I want to thank you, uh, Sandra, for a wonderful talk. Thanks for answering uh, questions. And yes, we have uh, your latest book in our collection. We missed a few. We also have your Count Your Waves and uh, your memoir, Don't Kill the Birthday Girl, right? Yeah. And you can find uh, Sandra's poems online on Poetry Foundation or uh, video poems. That's how I discovered Sandra. I was looking for something to play on our digital display, some video clips with poetry, with poems written, uh, read by poets, and how I found your video poems. You can find them on YouTube or uh, there are links from Sandra's website. So, oh, that's, yeah. that's great to hear. And actually, I'll be doing some more of those uh, in tandem with uh, the later, you know, later for this and also in tandem with the paperback release for this book. So do, more yeah, video great. poems on the Thank way. You. <laughs> you read ukulele. I remember finding ukulele um, as a video poem. Check them out. Thanks again, Sandra. Thanks uh, to all who joined us today. Um, and Sandra will have workshop on creative uh, nonfiction writing in July. July 24th, as far as I remember. Thanks again. Thank and you, everyone. Have a great time. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Sandra. Bye-bye.